So I promised you all that I would uh, give you a couple of my little observations that happen to me every once in a while when I'm a little hypoxic and, and running or something and my brain's not working exactly properly. And one of those is um, on obsolescence. During our YP panel that we had yesterday talking about the oh, okay. next generation of employees, right. people started talking about things that were obsolescent and, and I started thinking, back when my children were about uh, seven or eight years old, we went to my mother's house in South Alabama, Lower Alabama, LA, and she had a wall phone with a dial on it. And both my kids said, what is that? Because they'd never seen anything other than a phone that was wireless. And my, my mom had to explain to them how you use the dial to make telephone calls. So she, even in those, those days, had a obsolete telephone. Well, I just realized this past week that my telephone, and probably the telephone that 99.9% .9 of you guys have is going to be obsolete in the next couple of years. My wife broke her phone, and so we started looking around for new phones. We went into local phone stores, and there was this display of things called wearables. And when we were talking to people about phone plans, they started talking to us about phone plans for wearables. And all those things are, the, there are multiple companies that are making things like the Apple watch phone or the old Dick Tracy television phone that they had back when they had Dick Tracy and most of you probably don't even know who Dick Tracy is. I'm seeing these, no, don't know. Well anyway, it looks to me like in the next few years, these are going to be, go the way of the, uh, the tower computer go the way of the wall phone, and we'll be doing wearables. So um, find a place that you can put this in a, uh, a frame in your house. So our next panel, we're, we're really thrilled that we've got Team Redstone here, or some members of Team Redstone. We recognize that there's more than just Marshall here at Huntsville and on the Arsenal, and we're trying to expand and, and increase our, our a footprint here and increase the participation in this conference by some other folks who normally aren't part of it. So for our, our next team, Redstone, and the civil and DOD space discussion, we've got a, a moderator who is uh, really qualified to lead this, this, this discussion as we cross the lines between civil space and national security space. Uh, Dr. David Burns spent 20 years in the Air Force moving around more often than Todd May moved, as we talked yesterday about Todd's moves back and forth. He was a real Air Force person and moved hither and yon across the country multiple times. Uh, he was director of science and technology for the MDA, and now he's director of the Marshall Space Flight Center's Office of Science and Technology, where he leads a diverse, highly technical workforce of 300 civil servants and contractor employees. And I suspect he probably has some interface with some of these folks occasionally, and he'll help us understand that. So, Dr. Burns. Thank you. Wow, this, this is big. I, um, I appreciate the SLS in part because of uh, expands human presence in space. But when I look to it, I also think about the science that we can do. And I'll talk a little bit about that in my role. Um, I, as a director of science and technology, I, it, it's, it's kind of interesting to see the interplay between the two. Uh, as a technologist, I want to solve problems. There's something I want to get to. There's a mission that I want to enable. I focus on going to the moon or, or what crews would need if they were to, uh, to go to Mars. As a scientist, you're successful if you just come up with more questions. I mean, if you can think about more challenges within our universe and then you ask other people to ask questions, then you've been successful. We live in interesting and exciting times for space, and, and this panel will fit, uh, feature both civilian and defense leaders in space. Uh, the National Sec Space Council met earlier this month and gave renewed focus to our nation's space agenda. Dr. Mike Griffin was on that panel. He'll follow this panel, so I'm not going to talk further about the, uh, the National Space Council. He'll do a much better job than I would. Um, I'm hesitant to say that space as a domain is now at a crossroads, uh, just because that term is often overused. 
But it's hard not to think of it as being at a crossroads because it seems like there's more risk and opportunity in space than ever before. Technology and easier access to space has opened up whole new realms of possibilities. A few years ago, universities were launching satellites. Now it's high schools, and at least in one case, a middle school is putting together a, a free-flying space, uh, spacecraft. So if you look at what space has enabled, it's moved far beyond just a point destination to more of a means to an end. What can you accomplish in space? We're developing CubeSats and launching several of those, uh, a dozen on the next SLS flight, uh, then are essentially freely voyaging spacecraft. Scientific breakthroughs on the International Space Station are improving life here and on Earth, and, and, and as well as in uh, um, where we need to go for space. And we are learning pri profound things from our scientific investigations. And I want to take just a minute to talk about one of those. Uh, there's many things that are happening in science right now. There's so much noise in the, um, uh, in, in the community that it's hard to figure out which ones are really profound, but there's one that was just extra profound. Um, that was a merger of two neutron stars that was recorded on August 17th. Um, if you recall, this was one of the first cases where we were able to detect gravity waves, RF, optical, X-ray, and gamma rays, all from the same event. Now, this was 130 million light years away, so it happened 130 million years ago in a few weeks because it was August 17th. Um, but when you look at what happened, it's profound in part because it will give us a much better understanding about how matter changes forms. And this could lead to a better understanding of a unified field theory, for example, that could give us much uh, access to, to cheaper and plentiful energy, as well as new forms and new methods of traveling through space. Uh, the reason I brought this particular one up is because Marshall played a key role on three of the spectra that I just mentioned. Uh, the first is gamma rays. Um, Dr. Colleen Wilson-Hodge, who sits across the street at the National Space Science and Technology Center, which is part of Mar Marshall Space Flight Center, and a collaboration with UAH, um, was perhaps the first scientist to have known about the event. She was notified and uh, via a text message that something had gone on with the uh, gamma ray burst monitor. She's a principal investigator for the GBM, and that's an instrument on board the Fermi spacecraft. Um, after that, uh, 1.7 seconds to be precise, uh, gravity waves were detected by the LIGO, the Laser Inframetric Gravity Wave Observatory. Uh, LIGO, there's two of those um, in the U.S. There's one in um, Washington State, another one in Louisiana, and then there's a third one run by Italy. All three of those were able to triangulate and, and identify where the gravity waves came from. Uh, part of that was enabled by uh, Dr. Tyson uh, Littenberg, who also works at the NSSTC. He wrote a software algorithm that lowered the noise floor of the uh, gravity wave observatory. How low, might you ask? Well, they can measure a distance equal to one ten thousandth the diameter of a proton. So it's a staggeringly small distance, and they were able to push the noise floor. If they had to have done that, they wouldn't have been able to detect the gravity waves. Um, and I'll, I'll stop here, just I'll interrupt myself, interrupting myself here just for a second, uh, to tell you gravity waves are not like a difference in gravity. So the, uh, the pull of the Earth on the moon and the moon on the Earth, for example, uh, that's not what I'm talking about here. What gravity waves are is they're distortions in space, the fabric of space. So when this event came through our solar system, after traveling 130 mile, 30 million light years to get here, um, it actually contracted and expanded the very fabric of our space, an extremely small distance, uh, one ten thousandth the diameter of a proton, uh, perhaps a few of those, uh, uh, given that we were able to record the gravity waves for about 90 seconds. Um, but we were actually able to measure the distortion in space that occurred from this. Uh, we also have an idea of how gravity works as well, because gravity is part of, of, how, uh, of what distorts space. Um, so now we know roughly that all these, th all these things travel at the speed of light as well, because we didn't have any other way to, to really verify that. It's kind of hard to put a massive object and then all of a sudden remove it and figure out what that does. But we are able to do that as a result of these neutron stars merging. Um, we know roughly the mass that was converted into energy. Uh, that energy is in gravity waves as well as the, uh, the other spectrum that I mentioned. And from that, that gives us a better understanding how the world, world works around us. Finally, the last instrument that Marshall works on that uh, we actually managed the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which was also able to make measurements on this and correlate the findings from the other areas. So it's exciting times in, in uh, science. 
In addition to the wonderful promise of space, there are some challenges. Uh, the international space environment is quickly evolving, and today we'll hear from the defense side of space as well. Beyond defense, there is a national strategic strategy aspect to, to space. Uh, during Jason Chrisanne's testimony on lander technology, one of the panelists gave the following quote, water is the oil of space, we should view the, moon, the poles of the moon as the next Persian Gulf. So think about that for a bit. Water is the oil of space. Well, water is essential for life. We need it to drink. We need it to make oxygen, to breathe. Um, we also use it for propulsion. Um, and it's much easier to get water off the surface of the moon than it is off of Earth. Uh, you need big rockets to get off the surface of Earth. In, in addition to being at a deep gravity well, we have a lot of atmosphere that we have to fight through to get, uh, uh, to get a rocket up. If you're already at the moon, it is much easier to get water off the surface of the moon. And that's a strategic asset. That's something we can see every night, but it's also something everyone can see every night. And it's something that we need to figure out what our, what our plans are for as well. International partnerships and sometimes competitions are beneficial in space. Since Marshall Space Flight Center and Redstone Arsenal share some facilities, it's appropriate to discuss both civilian and defense applications of space. Today we're going to focus um, our conversation, really we're going to try to focus down to the responsive and adaptive part of, uh, of, of what you can do with space. And this includes things such as uh, using existing assets in different ways, uh, for example, disaster response, um, affordable access to space, innovative use, innovative use of space products, including position navigation and timing, uh, innovative manufacturing, testing and launch, and future architectures and game-changing technology. The panelists are each going to give a short presentation, and I'll introduce each one right before they start talking, and then we're going to take questions at the end. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll move over. And introduce our first um, guest speaker. Jim Ryder is the Deputy Associate Administrator for NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate. He's supported space technology for the past two years. Jim has been at NASA for over 30 years in a variety of leadership roles, including the Space Station, International, uh, and, sorry, Space Shuttle and International Space Station. Jim. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, let's see, I have control, don't I? Okay, what I have is, um, is about five charts. The first two I want to introduce, what we do in space technology. Um, and, and sort of how we prioritize our activities. And then I have like three, three pages of, of pictures of technologies that we're developing, and I'll give a, a short one-liner on, on, on those. Um, in NASA, we, you've heard over the last couple days um, that all mission directorates have some technology development activities. So human exploration does, uh, science mission directorate does, as Dennis Andrews mentioned. Um, and, and what we are responsible for are those cross-cutting transformative technologies. We look, work very closely with our sister mission directorates to do so, and, and also look for places where they, they benefit um, commercial as well as, in, as other government agencies and, and ourselves in our missions. Um, we do that over a broad portfolio of, uh, um, of, of technologies that, that follow along the technology readiness level. So we try to keep about 10% of our um, investments in push technologies, uh, lower TRL. Uh, we have a large percentage then that, that work put through um, what we, you know, try to, uh, at mid TRL level, try to bridge the gap from there to, to be able to fly. And then we try to keep about 15 or so um, technology demonstration larger missions in, in our space systems. Um, uh, in each of our areas, we strive for, um, competitive procurements, as well as um, uh, partnerships. So I talked about both mission directorates, but, um, and we have our own uh, versions of, of partnerships where we um, sponsor, we offer, um, it, it's called an announcement of collaborative opportunity, where we have uh, a number of topics and, and uh, we allow it, basically proposals to non-universal space sector agreements to utilize NASA's expertise, and, and we, we sponsor that part. Um, we also uh, do have a large development or a significant development in small spacecraft technologies and um, in, in fl and flight opportunities, as I'll talk about as we go forward. Um, and, and the way we, uh, 
the way we um, are, are think about ourselves is that we have six strategic thrust areas that, that we try to invest in. These are areas where we can't do this alone with our budget or anything, but, but we, try to, we try to identify areas where we think there's an enabling technology that we can push along to make a significant difference in that. Um, and so, uh, the first category there is expand utilization of nearer space. Uh, so that's things like safe, providing safe and affordable routine access to space, um, extension, reuse, um, and repair of, not, of near earth ass, assets, as I'll talk about some of our projects there. Um, the second category is enable efficient and safe transportation through space. I think, um, I'll, uh, so that's like cost effective and or reliable propulsion systems um, and enabling faster and or more efficient uh, deep space missions. Um, the third, ca and, and what I have is, is examples of where we're doing that in the next couple charts of, of, of for each of these. So, um, the third, third um, strategic thrust is to increase the access to planetary surfaces. We do a lot of the entry, descent, and landing development for the agency, uh, especially those where, you know, Mars is very hard. Um, and uh, our, the technologies we use today for rovers and stuff at the order of one and a half metric tons are not extensible to, to be able to land larger missions for human research. And so there's, it's a different sets of technologies to get to, say, a 20 ton uh, landing. Um, and uh, the, let's see, the fourth category is enable the next generation of science discoveries. Uh, we, uh, Dennis mentioned it uh, also when he talked yesterday. Uh, but there's a large budget in science mission directorate th for technology development. They focus, ten they tend to focus on the instruments themselves. Um, the, the capabilities to get the, to enable those things, the propulsion systems, the, the avionic systems and, and uh, navigation are the kinds of things that we, we f focus on and we work hand in hand to make those close. The other thing we've done um, that has been very successful is, is we, we try to look for ways to infuse our technologies. To, um, uh, I think Bill Gerstner and I talked about that uh, at, yesterday at lunch, um, and so what we've done for both uh, for both uh, science and HEO is we identify places where our technologies get infused into the mission. Um, one of the in, when science goes through their competitive procurements, uh, one of the, the, the stumbling blocks of ever introducing new technology is that they wouldn't get selected because it was too risky. So what we've done though is created a program where we offer a technology. Um, and, and then uh, give actually an incentive for them to incorporate it in their mission and not get counted down. We try to do it in a way that it's, um, uh, that it's complementary to the mission and not critical, not necessarily critical for the minimum objectives, um, but that seems to be working very well and I'll, I have a couple examples coming up. Um, uh, let's see, enabling humans to live and explore in space and on planetary surfaces. This is where we work very closely with human exploration. They, they carry the bulk of these technology developments uh, what we look for the places that we complement them and have a longer term view in situ resource utilization activities, um, some advanced life support, and, and some studies and modeling activities on radiation protection. Um, and then finally, we tie this all back together to um, grow and utilize the U.S. industrial and academic base. That's a key central element to all the five above there. Um, but we're responsible for the te uh, tech uh, excuse me, technology transfer the for the agency. The Small Business Innovative Research Program is ours to run for the agency. Um, and as well as we have different ways of engaging t uh, venture capitalists and, and public-private partnerships. So what I have then uh, coming up is, is, is some technologies, as I said, and what I tried to do is pick out ones that I thought were responsive to um, this panel, uh, responsive to the panel, which might be a little bit, dumb, dumb, which is the theme of this panel is responsive and adaptive. Um, so here's uh, the first set of technologies. Uh, um, I think almost every panel has mentioned solar electric propulsion since in the time that we've been here. We're actually developing the system, the, the, the th the Hall ion thruster, that's a 12 and a half kW system, about two and a half times what the current market has, uh, and as the, a cornerstone for um, the deep space gateway and then, then evolving from there for the deep space transport. Uh, there's also natural um, applications for commercial industry, as well as we've completed development of, of two types of advanced solar arrays that demonstrated half the weight, uh, specific weight and, and four times the packaging efficiency of, of current arrays. Uh, we had two of them that successfully went through TRL-6, uh, uh, both of which are being infused in the commercial market now, and one of which AFRL actually picked up f with ISS to demonstrate on ISS re recently, very successfully. Um, the Green Propellant Infusion Mission uh, is, is a technology we've had ready for launch for over a year now, waiting for the launch 
capability, but we take an Air Force uh, propellant that's um, non-toxic replacement for hydrazine and, and uh, with 40% higher volumetric efficiency, impulse efficiency. Um, and uh, our, this will be our opportunity to demonstrate something that, that can get, hopefully eliminate the need for scape suits. Um, uh, we do, what we have is an ev evolvable cryogenics uh, program uh, where we're de developing a variety of technologies to try to enable cry cryo fluid management on orbit for long term, including uh, with an objective of zero boil off uh, for, uh, for um, cryogens all the way to hydrogen. Um, the nuclear thermal propulsion is a technology that we're doing some risk mitigation activities to look at the, and evaluate the feasibility of using that for uh, a rocket stage uh, in space. Um, and uh, what we have is a, a, a multi-year program that we're kind of in the middle of now. Uh, one of the key aspects of that is to look at the feasibility of using low enriched uranium uh, fuel elements uh, to, to greatly simplify and hopefully reduce the cost of the activities uh, and, and test its viability. So far, that's pro we have promising results for that. And, and by the end of, ne of, of this fiscal year, uh, we'll have a review, review on the feasibility and cost assessment of that. Um, we have a couple of technologies here on, on uh, entry, descent, and landing. The hypersonic inflatable accelerator, aerodynamics accelerator. Um, like I said, uh, one of the prom most promising capabilities uh, for landing large masses um, in in the Mars orbit, you need um, you, you need um, to create a lot of area basically to to help improve the drag. Mars is really hard because it's a too thick of an atmosphere to to that you have to bother with it, and it's not thick enough to slow things down for you. And so it's a really a, a border, borderline thing, and, and we're, we have a scale model demonstration that we're developing for uh, a six meter uh, size uh, decelerator in the Earth's atmosphere that actually also has um, commercial applications as well. Um, and then we just recently developed, or finished a, a, what we call a cobalt or, or some precision landing demonstrations, and, and we have follow on projects for that. And then finally, we have a uh, one kilowatt uh, fission-powered nuclear uh, power system that we're, we've, we're developing that is uh, right now getting installed in, in the Department of Energy's uh, Nevada nuclear test site for some testing over the next few months. Um, High-performance spaceflight computing. Uh, the RAD 750 has been used for a long time, I think over a decade in, in science missions. And it's, you know, obviously not based on modern architecture. So the idea here is it's a partnership with Air Force SMC, Air, Air Force Research Lab, with Science Mission Director and ourselves leading it uh, to develop a multi-core fault tolerant, rad hard, scalable architecture using modern architectures. Um, LaserCom uh, is a cooperative agreement with, uh, partnership with HEO, um, as well as um, with, with support from Air Force, FRL. Uh, and uh, Air Force is providing the launch um, and uh, de encryption capabilities. Uh, HEO is providing the ground terminal, uh, and we're providing the flight terminal. And basically, we'll have a two-year demonstration starting in FY19 um, to demonstrate the use of optical uh, communications for 10 to 100 times bandwidth. Um, Deep Space Optical Com is a sister project, basically, to, to demonstrate it from deep space um, optical communications. This is one of those examples where it was, a, it was offered as a capability uh, to use, and, and the Psyche mission selected it. Uh, Sextant was also talked about a couple times over this. Um, what we have on, on ISS right now is a, is a, uh, a science mission director at NICER, uh, a payload called NICER, which is evaluating pulsars um, uh, and from, from the environment of the ISS. Uh, we have a sister project with that that's called Sextant, which is uh, basically looking at uh, the use of pulsars for, and demonstrating it for, for guidance, navigation, and control. Deep Space Atomic Clock is, is uh, a payload that we've also delivered and is waiting for its ride. Um, but basically, it's uh, to provide unprecedented navigation accuracy um, from an onboard system scaled down to sc satellite size. Um, with a drift rate of one second per 10 million years. And with that, it potentially enables uh, one-way communications for navigation, which greatly in, can in, improve the operations of the mission. Um, and then the other three are three um, small, small spacecraft, CubeSat, 6U type size. We, we have a number of technologies. It's a good platform for us to, to quickly demonstrate technologies 
Um, all three of these are getting ready to launch uh, this later this year or, or next, um, two of which actually are in the orbital ATK next launch cessation in, in November. Um, but it is an optical communications demonstration. The integrated solar array and reflector array is very unique, uh, innovative use basically of packaging to uh, package the solar array and the, the, uh, the antenna together and so greatly increase your, your capabilities for both power and, and down bandwidth. Um, and then finally, the CubeSat proximity operations demonstration is, uh, is uh, to demonstrate formation flying and docking of small spacecraft. And then finally, uh, we, we think uh, in-space robotic manufacturing and satellite servicing is a key area for, for potential growth and, and, and can cha game change and we have uh, three, pro three ongoing projects that are going very well in our ground demonstrations as well as is, is a significant effort in satellite servicing. Um, our flight opportunity program, we have uh, seven uh, suppliers for uh, small launch vehicles, providers for suborbitals and then we sponsor uh, payloads basically to, to get integrated and used on those. Um, low cost upper stage, we do a lot of activities in additive manufacturing, in, including rocket engines, most of it right here in Huntsville, um, and as well as that's a big area for um, collaborative opportunities in par public private partnerships. Uh, affordable vehicle avionics uh, is uh, a effort, one of the key uh, ways to get costs down is the avionics systems are pretty expensive on the nano launchers, and this is using off the, off the shelf parts uh, and demonstrating uh, those in a tissue sized box basically for navigation. Um, and then a couple, um, a tech transfer item, uh, there's a, we, we do a lot of uh, like entry systems uh, modeling. It turns out a lot of those, some of the, the flexible materials we have uh, make a potentially really good portable fire shelter. So we're working with the US Fire Forest Service for potentially something that would really be a game changer for, for them uh, for substantially improved capabilities. That the, um, Right now we're in the packaging stage and finishing that up, but it's one that, that uh, it's performance, thermal performance far exceeds what's the current capability. And then finally, we do a variety of challenges and, and other activities to try to engage a different part of, of the community. Uh, and we've had uh, five very successful um, challenges that are 500K in large, uh, to several million dollars over that have been ongoing. Uh, one of which was to demonstrate a 3D printed HAB that we, was a collaboration with um, a Department of, uh, let's see, the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as Caterpillar and, and some venture capitals and stuff. We have a follow-on phase plan for that, as well as a sister project um, with Army Corps of Engineers on, on a large scale, uh, use of in situ resource uh, materials. And so basically it's anywhere from Earth materials to things all the way to Mars and the Moon. And with that, um, so we're really excited about where we are. We think technology drives innovation and it drives exploration. Thank you, Jim. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Scott Cordella. Uh, Scott is a director within the Department of Defense's National Security Federally Funded Research and Development Center with responsibilities for MITRE's programs that support the national security space for the United States and its allies. Dr. Cordella is an RF systems engineer with over 35 years of experience, and he has led several Department of Defense and intelligence community-wide studies in sensing, served as a chief system engineer for several Department of Defense major systems acquisition and as a research in multi-end science. Scott. Thanks very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Scott Cordella here. And uh, first, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'm very privileged to be part of this group. And uh, MITRE is very uh, honored to be able to be a uh, sponsor of this as well with others. So thank you again for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to maybe take a different tact. I'm going to try to provoke you a little bit. Um, and, uh, and tell you a story and try to get you to think about stuff maybe a little differently. And the folks I'm really targeting are the folks who are not so gray as me, uh, the younger folks. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call this talk the information enterprise. So first, uh, a little background. Um, so uh, what's, a, what's a MITRE? MITRE is a company whose mission is to help make us all safer. And, a, and the way we do that is we operate what are called federally funded research and development centers, FFRDCs. These are uh, sponsored by the federal government with purpose in mind uh, to benefit us all. And the FFRDCs that we operate, there are seven. Uh, the Department of Defense FFRDC that I am a 
participant in, the, the FAA, the IRS, Health and Human Services, the Judiciary, Department of Homeland Security, and uh, NIST, uh, Nash, uh, in Institute for Science and Technology, Standards and Technology, I believe, uh, it's Cyber FFRDC. So these seven are a pretty large footprint. There are only about 42 FFRDC sponsored by the federal government. Our model is to work across all of these with no barriers, no boundaries. So where one uh, develops some practice, some, some, something useful, the other benefits. Our, our model is to work very uh, enterprise-wide, horizontally, and we do so through the execution of those FFRDCs. We also work internationally. Uh, I personally am involved in helping Australia develop its, what they call, Space 2.0 strategy, how they build their space capabilities uh, through the use of CubeSats and SmallSats, through subscribing to data providers, Digital Globe, that sort of thing, and then the classic large uh, satellites that the national security apparatus uh, has developed. And we work with commercial uh, vendors closely, uh, and I'll talk about that as I go through. So I want to talk about the information enterprise. Um, historically, space has been all about the space vehicles. And uh, we all see the, the pictures. We saw a few this morning of uh, beautiful uh, shots of space vehicles, of Mars, uh, launch. Uh, and that's uh, necessary, but that's not all that is uh, part of the overall space apparatus. I would ask you to think about what we call the information enterprise that the data coming from those systems is part of the overall information enterprise. And one of my colleagues likes to say, when we see the beautiful pictures with the satellites on the top and the ground stations on the bottom, turn that upside down. And think about the important thing is what happens to the data. And that's what I think of when I talk about the information enterprise. So what is that? We talk a lot uh, as a community about the internet of things, our smartphones, our refrigerators, our cars, uh, traffic cameras, the data from everything being integrated. So now let's think about space and the data from space. That's uh, a contributor to the information enterprise just like any other. And in some sense, it's a good thing that space becomes merely another provider of information. We like the fact that space is becoming more accessible, almost, and not a pejorative term, but mundane. It's not unusual for us to see satellites on orbit providing data. Uh, we can subscribe to that data easily. And uh, we talked about high schools. There's one up my way, Thomas Jefferson, that launched a CubeSat. It's not heroic anymore to go to space, at least in LEO. The federal government is no longer the sole proprietor of space. Uh, there's opportunities. And so again, to the, the younger folks in the room, uh, you too can fly a satellite if you choose. The price points are not unrealizable for any of us. So there's an opportunity there. Um, so what do we need to do in, in the context of this information enterprise? Um, well, I use the phrase information enterprise because MITRE is all about the information, space-based information as well as others. And as an enterprise systems engineer, we are thinking about that. And I know we're not alone in that. Um, so what do we need? We need architectural thinking about how to integrate space-based information into this information enterprise with some themes in mind. And we've talked a little bit about this in the prior panel, openness and resilience. So openness means, uh, and to the point that was asked earlier uh, about small companies wanting to become part of this venture, it should be open to them. There should be opportunities for small businesses, 
uh, small uh, uh, proprietors to enter into the space market. That's a component of the information enterprise. But in doing that, there needs to be some resilience so that we're all protected in some sense, protected by uh, mishaps that we didn't intend or by some actors who intend to do some damage. So openness and resilience are some themes. So I use this evolution in the, enterprise, the information enterprise. I say, build it, then use it, then automate it. So let me talk about those for a second. So what does build it mean? What is it? The information enterprise. What do we mean when we talk about building it? And this is something that the community that I work in is, is, has been doing for some time, and this creates an opportunity for cross-pollinization of best practices, joint opportunities, joint challenges. So what do we mean by build it? Um, so, we are seeing a separation of applications from infrastructure. So in the past, there have been unique solutions where software applications and processing infrastructure were tied explicitly together, not separable. And that created vendor lock, duplication of effort amongst programs, uh, not being so interoperable. Um, this was a bad thing. And so the national space community has uh, moved in a very strong way to separate apps from infrastructure. And we share the infrastructure. We share apps. And we're looking for multifunction apps, apps that do the same sort of thing for different programs. And infrastructure, what do I mean by that? We talk a lot about cloud-based computing commodity processing, unique processing, uh, these IT solutions. And this is a big deal for space. It's uh, not just, excuse me, the shiny rocket. It's the information enterprise and the IT, IA, uh, app uh, domain that pertains that is a growing, growing big deal. So build it. Use it. So once we've built this infrastructure, what do we do with it? What I see in the community that I work in are what we would call problem-centric processes, workflows, a series of concatenated if-then statements. We want to solve a problem. We know what the steps are for that problem. We can create lab view-like workflows, drop in place icons that connect to one another and automate that process, uh, but only that process, that problem. It takes a long time to discover what are the right steps for a given problem and then put them into code and make it run. But that's where we are now. We're, we're using it and uh, in, in doing that, we're beginning to see what I call persistent processing. So we talk about persistence all the time in our, our community. Sometimes we talk about persistent sensing. I'm talking about persistent processing, a set of activities that are always ongoing that are problem-centric. So use it. Subscribers can subscribe to those problems and get products from those, pro uh, those, uh, those efforts. Automate it. That's where we're going. Once we can describe it, we can automate it. Now, we shouldn't automate everything. There's some things that humans have to be involved in. We heard the safety conversation earlier. But there are some things that could be automated and should be automated, must be automated, given how fast the problems go these days. Um, that's the opportunity space. And um, so the question is not, can I automate? It's what should I automate? And so we talk in our community a lot about um, cognitive assistance, sort of the buddy to the human, human-machine teaming. Um, and what do we shed to the machine? What do we retain for the human? So these are very hard choices, and they're not just technical ones. They're policy ones. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, lawyers in these conversations. It's a, it's a difficult question. 
But in our community, we're struggling with what uh, we would call a TRL scale for automation. So if you Google something called the Sheridan scale, Professor Sheridan from uh, MIT years ago created a, a scale of automation for robotics. Imagine that for the information enterprise. How do we think about that? Um, so where are we going? What have we learned? We've learned that in this migration to an information enterprise, we need what we call a ruthless ruler. We need somebody who is going to be hard-headed and not take no for an answer in migrating to those things that we all need to share at the information enterprise level. There are exceptions that uh, are compelling in some cases. We have to recognize that, but we have to have someone who's an enforcer. That's a lesson. Function follows form, not form following function. Function is um, let's create organizations whose job is to work enterprise-wide in this information enterprise and give them the resources that they need to do their job. Um, be realistic. Not everything can be common. Uh, recognize there are unique solutions. And as we do this, this will create, I believe, and we see more competition, uh, avoiding vendor lock, bringing new companies in, and so on. Um, and this allows us finally in this resilience conversation to think about resilience at an enterprise level. Once we've separated apps and infrastructure, we have enforced some ruthless ruler uh, uh, edicts on the use of that, now we can bring in enterprise-wide resilient approaches. So as I close, I, I think there are some uh, lessons from the national security space community that the civil and commercial communities can learn from. We are purposefully working on those uh, lessons learned. We do have a, a forum coming up in January at the Center for St Strategic and International Studies uh, where we'll talk about that between the national security space and the civil space, commercial space. And uh, I believe there's a great opportunity for uh, lessons learned. So finally, to the young people, I would encourage you to think about the information enterprise. And I'll tell you, just to provoke you more, as I looked at the poster sessions, I didn't see anything that spoke to what I think of as the information enterprise. Maybe it's there, but I didn't recognize it. Um, think about that, because I think you're very familiar with software and apps and so on. You may not be thinking about that in this domain, and that's a new opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Our next presenter is John R. London III, currently assigned as the Chief Engineer to the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command, SMDC, Space and Strategic Systems Director at Redstone Arsenal. London is a retired Air Force officer and served in positions within the Air Force Logistics Command, Air Force Systems Command, Air Force Material Command, the National Reconnaissance Office, and the Ballistic Missile and Defense Organization, as well as NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. John. Thanks. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to be here with this group. Uh, I think I was here a few years ago, so it's great to come back and, in, uh, in some sense, uh, give you a little uh, status report on where we are. First of all, though, I think people would say, uh, what's the Army doing in space? Uh, I get that question a lot. Uh, not quite as much as I used to. We've been at this about 11 years now over at SMDC. Uh, it turns out that the Army, uh, uh, between October of 1960 and December of 2010, took a 50-year, two-month hiatus on building and flying spacecraft. The Army is the largest consumer of space data within the Department of Defense. Some people don't know that, but uh, it certainly is a fact. Uh, so the Army is tremendously dependent on data. There's, there's some information I don't have here today uh, to talk about, but it really uh, is amazing how much the Army depends on space data. And yet, uh, in, we took that 50-year uh, hiatus, uh, but around uh, 2006 time frame, we started looking at the emerging uh, technologies for small satellites and what they uh, could provide to the warfighter. And despite the uh, tremendous uh, budgets and tremendous capabilities that have been developed uh, in national security space within the intelligence community, uh, certainly what the Air Force provides and, and the Navy as well, actually, to some degree, um, there are still gaps in data that the soldier in the field needs. And so we're uh, focusing on those gaps, trying to fill them for the warfighter 
everything we do uh, is about the warfighter. I had a three-star general tell me right before we launched that satellite in 2010, he said, make sure it supports the warfighter because if it doesn't, you might as well launch my toaster. And, uh, you know, when the three-star tells you that and uh, says it that way, you kind of remember it, and I have remembered it and shared it with you here today. But I want to just uh, go through and talk about some of the programs we have. Um, and uh, some things Scott said really uh, caught my attention here. Yeah, I've got some pretty pictures here of some satellites, but the ground is the hard part. And that, that really is something that we uh, have come to recognize as we go through this. Satellites are tough, but they're not as tough as the ground infrastructure you need to move that data. Uh, we have something called the TCPED process uh, that you might be familiar with, the tasking, collection, processing, exploitation, dissemination. Uh, you have to be able to address all elements of that for the space enterprise that you're conducting to be worthwhile. Because if you can't move the data to the consumer, then really uh, you might as well have launched a toaster. So uh, this is the agenda. I'm going to talk about some of the programs we're working on today um, and give you a little update on them. Uh, the first one is uh, called Kestrel I. Kestrel I uh, started uh, too many years ago for me to remember. I've, I've kind of jokingly said it's kind of the Army's uh, James Webb Space Telescope uh, in a much smaller uh, form factor. Uh, but m I really speak for that more programmatically than technically. Uh, it's taken us a long time to get here. A lot of reasons why I won't go into it. But the point is, um, on Tuesday of this week, at 4.40 in the morning, the Kestrel I spacecraft uh, was released from the International Space Station as a free flyer. And that was uh, an enormous milestone for us. You know, to a lot of people, you say, well, this is a satellite about the size of a dorm room refrigerator. What's the big deal? It was a big deal for the Army uh, because it's, uh, it's got the attention of the Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, the Acting Secretary of the Army, so it is a big deal. Uh, we are working this as a joint capabilities technology demonstration. That means that the Office of the Tech Secretary of Defense is in charge. Uh, and they're calling the shots, but we're executing it for them. We have a lot of partners. Uh, JCTDs are great in many ways, but they're challenging programmatically because you essentially have four people managing the program simultaneously, and that can be interesting. Uh, but we, uh, our operations manager is U.S. Uh, manager is US Pacific Command, uh, and they have a lot of reasons that they're interested in this. Uh, we are the technical managers at, at SMDC and our transition managers, PEO Missiles in Space, right here at Redstone Arsenal. Uh, the purpose of the JCTD is really to not only demonstrate the technology, but see how can it be transitioned, how quickly can it be transitioned to the warfighter. So just uh, another chart on Kestrel I, what it looks like. Unfortunately, that picture in the middle is a graphical uh, uh, rendering. I actually have a photograph now that I can show you. One of the nice things about going off of a space station is you get a lot of neat pictures of your spacecraft as it's being deployed, and we have those. Uh, from the ground standpoint, one of the elements of it is the gator antenna on the, uh, the bottom, I guess the bottom left uh, part of the uh, chart there. Uh, gator is an inflatable, it's a, it's a parabolic dish that's uh, uh, inside that inflatable ball. It's very tactical, very transportable. Two people, and, and that is a LEO tracking 2.4-meter uh, uh, parabolic dish, and it is very transportable. Two people uh, can set it up in about a half an hour, and you can put it in check baggage on a commercial aircraft and send it wherever you need it. So that's the kind of mobility we need, the kind of responsiveness, responsiveness we need for the warfighter. Kestrel is an imager. Uh, it does visible imaging. Um, it's got a 25-centimeter primary mirror. Uh, the resolution we expect from the orbit we're going into from the ISS is about, uh, we expect resolution somewhere around 1.2 to 1.3 meters, uh, which is um, tactically relevant. Uh, and just one last thing, a shout-out of thanks uh, to NASA for helping us uh, get this on orbit. Uh, for Nanorax, uh, they were our integrator and uh, certainly uh, played a huge role in this. Uh, for the DOD uh, Space Test Program, which really made this happen through Nanorax and through NASA. And then finally, uh, SpaceX, who gave us the ride to orbit. So uh, uh, I dwelled on this one a little bit, but again, for the Army, it's a big deal. Uh, the next... The next one I want to talk about, uh, this is a program uh, we're doing for communications, tactical communication for the warfighter. 
Uh, we've, we've had a couple of programs before this. this we really consider this our third generation uh, tactical satellite. Uh, the first two, SMDC-1, uh, which was the satellite that flew back in December 2010 and broke that 50-year hiatus. Uh, and then after that, the SNAP spacecraft. Both of those were 3U spacecraft, if you're familiar with CubeSat parlance. This is a 6U, uh, a little more power, a little more capability, but intended to provide uh, UHF communications in this uh, particular instance for uh, handhelds that are already deployed and in, uh, in the field today. So the idea is we don't change uh, the ground side, we focus on the space element uh, which we can control easily in uh, providing that capability. Uh, the next uh, program I'll talk about is Gunsmoke J. Uh, this is uh, an interesting program because uh, it, it is a JCTD. Uh, U.S. Pacific Command, again, is the operations manager. The transition manager in this case is PEO IEWS at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Uh, it is a battlefield uh, uh, situational awareness uh, system. Uh, it, is a, it is a 3U satellite, so it's about the size of a loaf of bread. I've got a rendering of it here coming up in just a second. Uh, but we're working very closely with um, both uh, U.S. Uh, Special Operations Command, although they're not the operations manager, they provide a huge benefit to this, and I'll talk about that here in a moment. And our executing agent is Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, our independent assessor is the National Assessment Group out at Albuquerque at Kirtland Air Force Base. Uh, all JCTDs require what we call joint military utility assessments, which means uh, after you fly it and you're ready to test it, uh, an independent assessor uh, assesses it and then comes back with a report card and tells you how well you did. So hopefully we'll, we'll do well on this one as well as, uh, as, well as Kestrel I. So this is what the Gunsmoke J spacecraft looks like. Um, if you look on the left-hand side, you see that's the Prometheus Block II. Prometheus Block II was a system developed by U.S. Special Operations Command down in uh, Tampa at McDill Air Force, at McDill Air Force Base. Uh, it's a one and a half U. Uh, they've flown a number of those already uh, and have been uh, successful in that effort. Uh, they have a specific mission that they're using it for, but they cleverly designed it, uh, certainly Los Alamos uh, uh, in partnership with SOCOM, uh, cleverly designed the one and a half U to where it could accommodate a one and a half U payload module. So we took advantage of that architecture, and so we have the Gunsmoke J payload module that will integrate with that. So uh, we're working again closely with SOCOM and LANL uh, on this program. We hope to fly this uh, in about uh, 15 months. Uh, Harbinger is actually a crater that we have with industry. York Space Systems is developing a, um, a kind of a mini Esper Ring class spacecraft. We are actually manifested uh, on a uh, rocket lab mission for this. Uh, this. Again, the DOD Space Test Program has worked very closely with us to provide that opportunity. The payload is a synthetic aperture radar imager. It's a big deal. Uh, you know, synthetic aperture radar, if you could have a persistent constellation of these to where you had on-demand imagery, day, night, all weather, uh, that's a game changer for the tactical warfighter. So we're excited about this uh, crater that we're working with York Space Systems. Uh, this one might be familiar to some in the room. Uh, this is a uh, effort that we have. It's really an in-house effort. This ACE is red. Uh, we're just really essentially, I say, I mean, it's a, it's a big deal, but uh, we're looking at taking literally off-the-shelf COTS hardware that's not necessarily space rated and seeing how well it does in the space environment. Uh, UAH is playing a big role in this. This is an in-house effort with our concepts analysis lab over at SMDC, but as I said, UAH, UAH has a major role in the design, the development, the integration of this. This will fly to the space station. It will not be a free flyer. It'll be on the station for about a year of operations. So finally, uh, just to get off the stage here, I want to uh, kind of uh, again talk about that TCPED process. It's all about getting data to the warfighter. We talk about decentralized control and decentralized execution as one of the tenets of Army space. And what we mean by that is that we don't want the control of the system, the, that TCPED process, we don't want that to be controlled from uh, somewhere afar. We want it to be in the hands of the local commander, where the local commander can tell the satellite what he or she needs it to do. And that data can be, be provided to the local commander and his or her soldiers 
in very short order. That's the decentralized control, decentralized execution. And we think that aspect of it really does set us apart and it gives us an unprecedented uh, capability that hasn't been here before. So I appreciate your time. Thank you and uh, look forward to any questions. Thank you, John. Our next panelist is Dr. James Kirsch, uh, the Acting Director of the Weapons Development Integration D Directorate within the Aviation Missile Research and Development Engineering Center. Dr. Kirsch has over 30 years experience in systems engineering, missile research and development, and technical management within the Army. He supports the development and execution of missions and functions of over 400 scientists and engineers engaged in missile science and technology research, development and engineering throughout the weapons system life cycle. Thanks, James. So this morning, uh, before I get into the topic this morning, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a background on, on what does the MRDEC do since we're not typically tied in with the space community necessarily. But, but a, as you heard in my bio this morning, really what we're responsible for is providing the technical expertise to the Army for development of their aviation and missile technologies. And particularly on my side of the house, on the missile side of the house, we're responsible for all of the component technologies as well as the system level technologies for all of the Army's tactical rocket and missile systems. So you might think, how does that apply to space? And in particular, where we make a lot of use of space is in the information, as, as John said, the information that we get from space. And in particular today, I want to talk about navigation technology. So GPS is, is I think, easy, easily to say it's, it's ubiquitous across everything we do. Uh, as we talked to earlier in the introduction about uh, all of the cell phone technologies and wearable technologies, just about anything we have today in some way is tied into GPS position. Um, and that has become uh, the tr true across the Army as well. Just about everything we do in some way, shape, form, or fashion is tied into GPS. Prior to GPS, we spent an awful lot of time and money investing in inertial navigation systems and trying to take those inertial navigation systems and improving the performance of them. Once GPS came along, we were able to take GPS and couple it with inertial technology and really begin to focus more from the inertial side on reducing the size, weight, and power and cost of those inertial systems. They didn't have to be as high performing now because we had GPS as that uh, backup or that, that uh, check on where we were inertially. Uh, as I said, it's not uh, unique to the Army, but it is something that is ubiquitous across uh, our life today. So as the Army has looked at that and said, uh, we, we've seen an, uh, our high dependence on GPS, we've decided we also need to take a look at in what ways do we need to reduce our reliance on GPS or at least have other technologies that back up our GPS position. And, and in the missile world, that means what can we do from an inertial standpoint to tell us where we are and where we're going without being 100% dependent on GPS. And to do that, we're actually going back in time, if you will, and looking at some historical methods of navigation and what can we do to, with today's technology to improve those historical methods of navigation, which when combined with GPS gives us a much more resilient capability. So years ago, navigation for aircraft was predominantly vision-based. You looked out the window and you looked at the railroad tracks or the geography, uh, telephone poles, or in that case, telegraph poles to tell you where you are and, and help you figure out where you needed to go from there. Now, most of our platforms have some type of vision system on them, uh, typically for reconnaissance type applications, but even our missile seekers have vision type systems on them. And with the technology we have today, we can combine those vision systems with databases of maps and geographical features and do navigation uh, automatically without having to have somebody stick their head out the window. So that gives us a little bit of a, a backup to what GPS tells us we're doing. Celestial is certainly probably one of the oldest methods of navigation. And again, with some of the technology we have available today, we're looking at uh, can we use celestial navigation automatically to tell us where we are and help us navigate in areas where perhaps GPS is denied to us? And then finally, an old way that we're looking at in a new method is sky polarization. 
the Vikings used polarization to give them an idea of where they were by simply looking at the sky through a crystal that gave them, an, in effect, a polarization map of the sky. Now companies are able to look and actually measure that polarization content of what they see in the sky and then compare it to maps of what, or models of what we think that polarization ought to be. So for example, uh, we can measure that polarization and first we model what we think that polarization map ought to look like. Then we measure what the polarization in the sky we actually see and by combining those two, we can predict actually where we are on the planet and which direction we're focused. So that helps us navigate in a lot of different ways. Uh, I think it's easy to say that none of those systems by themselves will replace what we're doing for navigation in long range systems today, but they add to our capabilities, uh, not totally relying on just GPS or just inertial navigation, but providing these other technologies that can add to our ability to tell us where we are and where we need to go. Thank you. Thanks, James. Our next panelist is Dr. Sherry Feth. She is currently the Director of Science and Technology at the Missile Defense Agency, where she is responsible for the science and technology efforts across the agency. Dr. Feth has a broad technical background with 30 years of experience spanning all aspects of system engineering. Prior to her 13-year tenure at the Missile Defense Agency, she worked at the NASA Space Architecture Office and conducted fundamental research at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. It's an unusual opportunity for the Missile Defense Agency to get to participate in uh, something like the NASA Forum, um, but I'll tell you there's no manned space flight for us. <laughs> so we have an a interesting mission. We are a joint service agency. What that means in defense terms is there's no one service that owns us. We're, we have a rotating set of positions from the military as well as civilian positions. As an example, our current director is a three-star general in the Air Force. He just took over from a three-star admiral in the Navy who replaced a three-star general in the Army prior to him. So we truly are a joint agency. We cover information and systems from all over, all of the services, all the warfighters. So our mission specifically, and I'll give you that, and this is, it doesn't look so great here, but you'll have to bear with me on the picture. It looks better in my paper. Um, so our mission is to develop a, and deploy, and that's key, we're doing both, a layered ballistic missile defense system that will defend the United States, its deployed forces, allies, and friends from ballistic missiles in all ranges and all phases of flight. So that ends up translating to a really broad issue where the main point is we are defense, we are not an offensive system. Um, we are an agency that does research and development, including advanced technology development, while at the same time, we are an agency responsible for producing and building components that are sent to the field, and we also currently maintain operations for things in the field as well. So that gives us kind of a really broad spectrum that we have to manage all at the same time. And the reason that's important is it means I can't tell you about most of the cool stuff we're really doing. So what I will do is walk you through, this is our sort of 10-step method, if you will, our process for how we actually intercept uh, an adversary's missile. So the concept, which I think you've heard of before, is hitting a bullet with a bullet. So our enemy is firing something at us. It's going to be traveling at ballistic speeds, and we are going to intercept that not with any sort of um, explosive device. We're going to intercept it purely with the kinetics of two things hit intercept. They're just hitting each other. So to do that, there's a lot of really advanced technology that goes into it. That can be done today. There's also projected things that we want to do in the future that have even more advanced technology associated with them. And the reality is space plays in most of it. So the first thing you have to do when you're, when you're going to uh, try and defeat the incoming missile is you've got to know it's there. So we have to detect it. Uh, and detection really is mostly focused on space. We utilize systems that belong to all sorts of different agencies, whatever information we can get in that provides those detections. Um, 
the next step you do is called queuing. And what that means is a lot of times the detection systems are rel relatively low resolution. And they just kind of say, hey, it's over in this area. But that's not sufficient to get high resolution data. So we take as much information as we can from those systems and use that to queue our more higher resolution systems. Those can now start doing more detail. They can do tracking. Um, and then they can also do step four, which is called classification discrimination. Now in that case, we're starting to figure out what is the missile? What's the missile? What's the rocket body? And how are these things flying? Basically, we're trying to figure out what do we shoot? We want to shoot the lethal part. We don't want to shoot the whole complex, right? Uh, after that, we have to build a fire control solution. That is part of what we talked in the in, uh, information portion about how you interface your man and your machine. Uh, that is a very good example of that, where you have a whole lot of data coming from all of these different sensors. It has to be assimilated. It's partially assimilated by the machine, but the final decision is made by an actual human operator. And that, that decision is whether or not and how he's going to intercept that incoming missile. Once the decision is made, you launch. And so you can see on the um, far right side here, we've got our, our interceptor going up. And it gets launched. And then you've got to remember, these sensors don't just quit as soon as they've sent a message on. They're there the whole time. They're talking to each other. You've got the little Shazam things in there. That's my, my information enterprise. They're all talking to each other. They talk to the ground. And we give, it, we give regular updates to the interceptor. So basically, in the time it takes to get the decision and push the button to launch, more information's coming in. And so we have several updates that go to the interceptor that correct its course or identify a little bit more information on where it needs to go. The next step then is to, uh, so we, we launch like a more normal missile or a rocket, but what actually does the intercepting itself is an exoatmospheric kill vehicle for predominantly. We have a couple other options, but the main, that's the main um, consideration. So that is basically a space vehicle that's up there. Um, once we intercept, that's the tricky part. But then the other part, we got to know that we actually hit something. So we also have sensors that we use to make sure we're, we're aware that it has been killed. And, and that tells us whether we need to launch something else to shoot again, or whether that now has been neutralized. We don't need to worry about it. So the interesting part about this is space plays not only a significant role in little individual aspects, it plays in just about everything, from the data communications to the actual exoatmospheric space vehicle and to all of the sensors. And, and many of these sensors are actually space-based sensors. So we're taking data in from all over. So that's our operations. The other thing then we do is also some research and development. And so some of the capabilities that we do there is we actually utilize the space environment to do experiments. So we do some sounding rocket experiments. Um, we do a lot on unmanned aerial vehicles, which is not exactly space, but sort of. Some of them fly amazingly high, some of these vehicles do. Um, and then also some of the nanosats and cubesats that you've heard about. Uh, we do a lot of collaborative work with different agencies and organizations across the Department of Defense and outside of the Department of Defense. We rely heavily on the federally funded research and development centers, as well as uh, several of the national labs. And I think, oh, we also use some new things, looking at some new things in terms of balloons is another area that's uh, something that we, I guess we call it pseudo space. So um, that's it. Thank you, Dr. Beth. So now we're going to open up to questions. And I have a question or two that I'll ask. I'm sure they're not going to be as interesting as any questions you guys want to ask. So if there are any questions, raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll get us started with one. There's one in the back. Jim, you mentioned PPPs today. Uh, people have been mentioning them over the last couple of days. Now, for those of us who have done project finance, a PPP is a very defined financing mechanism. I was wondering if you could define for yourself or NASA what you think PPP means in your construct with working with other people. Yeah, sure, and, and PPP um, stands for public-private partnerships oh, for those. I know what it stands for. No, I, I wasn't telling you. I was just making sure everybody knew. <laughs> Obviously, you did. Um, so um, what we try to do is, is we look for those opportunities that fit as a public-private partnership is there has to be a partnership. And so there has to be stake in the game from, from both entities. They both have to have uh, a ultimate use 
for, for the capabilities. And, and when those things come together, you can have a, a complementary situation where, where um, you can um, greater leverage each other's resources. Uh, we implement public-private partnerships in multiple different models, as you say, is, and so at that point it becomes an acquisition device uh, aspect. Um, one of the models we do is 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 um, one of our other transaction authority at NASA tends to be in in space act agreements. Non-reimbursable space act agreements are ones where we both bring things to the table, and and but there's no exchange of funds. Uh, we have also public-private partnerships where we're willing to put a stake in the game, the large share of stake in the game, and uh, similar to some of the other BAAs and stuff, we'll do what we call a tipping point solicitation where, where we'll contribute 75% or 70% or some number uh, of, of, that, of, um, of, of the total investment. Um, but but uh, the critical part is there's a stake in the game on both sides. Um, and it really depends on, on the arrangement and, and the circumstances of what mechanism you use best. Uh, those things that are one of the kind that are NASA there are really not, that while we might use innovative acquisition approaches, um, they're not really public-private partnerships uh, in that form. Uh, whereas other things uh, where there's a strong commercial need and interest, then those are ones that, that are much more collaborative. So. Thank you. Is there another question? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk, it was really informational. Uh, but in this large data system, where you are all consuming huge amounts of data, which, is, which development is more important, the technology development, such as developing better sensors for small satellites or better propulsion systems, better control systems, better computers on board, uh, or is development of the integration of all the information more important to what you're doing? Do you need better information or do you need better integration? Scott, I'll let you start with that one. Well, I'll punt. I, I don't know how to say one is more important than the other. Um, uh, a personal story. So uh, as, as was said, I, I'm a radar guy by trade. So I came into this community thinking as a sensor person. And um, I was overwhelmed by how much the information piece dominates uh, what seems to be evolving. Not to say people aren't building more exquisite sensors, they are. In my view, these converge. That uh, we use words in the sensor domain like upstream processing, where we take raw data from a sensor, IQ data if you're a radar person, and you post that into a cloud or a data repository. And then you cut through that information with a problem that looks for um, self-consistency in the data against that problem. So in some sense, the IT community bumps into the sensor community simultaneously. So you, you can't have one without the other. I don't know that that answers your question. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, it's a very exciting opportunity to get exposed to an array of cutting technologies. Uh, now, before I ask the question, uh, please allow me to introduce myself briefly. Um, I'm a professor and also a uh, researcher in uh, product innovation. I'm from a college business uh, uh, at UH. Uh, about two years ago, uh, for my uh, uh, new product development course, I um, uh, teamed up with uh, uh, NASA to uh, design a consulting project for NASA. Uh, the main purpose of the project was to uh, enhance student understanding uh, and the knowledge of the new product development process. Uh, and the consulting pro the project yielded a very uh, productive outcome. Uh, let me give you an example. One student group um, identified a novel application of a technology that Na NASA specialist designed to support uh, satellite in the space. And that student group identified the uh, application that can be applied for commercial use on the ground. Uh, more specifically, the technology, they, uh, the application they identified was to um, uh, design a new product concept for the wind turbine blade. Um, so given this background, I have two questions. One for the panelists for NASA, uh, and I know that NASA in addition to uh, the collaboration with UAH, uh, NASA also initiated a similar program with other universities. 
And my question for the panelist expert from NASA is, uh, what's the status of the program? Uh, did it uh, um, produce uh, any um, real commercial applications um, that uh, you know, organizations or uh, other companies uh, effectively apply to increase the efficiency of the operation, operational routine? Uh, second question is for the other panelists. Um, do you have any program or plan, similar program or plan to collaborate with university and um, uh, to uh, identify novel application of the technology for the design, originally designed for space uh, to um, use this on the ground? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Okay, let me, let me see if I can, there's, there's two parts to that, and uh, I think I can actually discuss the second one myself, which is part of the STTR program. Um, the first, Jim, is Centennial Challenges correct on this one, or is there, um, I'll, I'll let you. Uh, you and have. and uh, so would you repeat what specific program you were talking about that the UH? Uh huh. Okay, well, I'll, I'll probably have to answer a bit more generically because I'm not quite sure exactly which program you're talking about. But, but what we have is a space technology research grants that we sponsor where we have a, a number of different, where it's the primary where we do, do research grants with universities. Um, and we have multiple aspects of that. Um, first, a, a strong fellowships program for, for those uh, candidate graduate students. Uh, we have early career faculty program. Uh, and and um, what we call early stage innovation programs, where we pick topics that are relevant to us that we want uh, fundamental research done or base, uh, research done at universities. And now we have a couple of, of research institutes where we have a consortiums. So in addition to that, almost all of our programs also use grants as part of it. And so their centennial challenges is, is is one place where universities are often um, are often the place that wins. Um, and in fact, there it's it's. For those programs, uh, like we had, uh, we, we recently had, I mentioned the pre 3D printed hab, but we also had a CubeQuest challenge where universities um, actually were w winners of those. Uh, universities win almost all the time with us. Uh, Penn State just won this summer. Um, uh, CubeQuest, we, we had the winners there were, were where you, they actually had to develop a, cubes, uh, a CubeSat uh, that would launch on a SLS. And, and, go, and do a deep space mission either on the moon or, and, and they would get prize money. We didn't pay anything up front uh, along the way. And we did also a, a, a space robotics challenge uh, where, uh, where um, all the entrants developed um, software basically that we demonstrate on a, on a robot. And, and so all these programs and what we try to do is look very carefully where is the infusion path and, um, and, and how, we, how we can enable that for, for us. Um, most of the time, we have follow. We, you know, there's opportunities for follow-up, um, and the, the space technology tr tr tech transfer area is one where where universities pair then with an industry partner to try to transfer that technology. So we act, we find ourselves. It was it was a higher percentage that get infused than I than I really expected because you're dealing with things that you don't really expect a huge turnover. But and so I apologize. I can talk to you later about the exact uh, one because I'm not quite familiar with that. But um, at, at least based on what we've said so far. Uh, but but we try very hard to have uh, have a, an engaged uh, university system and 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 promote the technologies from there. Let me add on to what Jim said there real quick. And there's another avenue of um, opportunities as well. If you go to Fed BizOps, um, the, the uh, that actually covers the Department of Defense as well as um, um, NASA, and actually covers all the all the U.S. government uh, opportunities as well. And you'll sometimes see a broad agency announcement or a broad area announcement that will come down to VAA. And mm -hmm. uh, there's, I, I haven't seen something that's integrated where all the space for everybody is all in one box. Instead, we, we almost view space as, as an enabler to do other things. So it'd be hard to just align it under space because you might see dramatically different applications. Um, so you, you really pretty much have to go and search on FedBizOps to find those. Hi. Uh, yesterday, our former NASA administrator, Mr. Dr. Mike Griffin, uh, mentioned the challenges in federal acquisition. And I was wondering if the panel might be able to comment on any, any 
methods used outside the federal acquisition regs that may be helping you with any technology or science-related acquisition? Thanks, Mark. That's a good question. Uh, John, can I volley that one to you? Thanks. Okay, I'll uh, take a swing at it. Um, certainly, uh, the, the FAR-based acquisition process that we uh, live with um, can be challenging. Uh, there are reasons for it. Uh, it's to make sure we do it right, we do it legally, we do it uh, ethically, morally, and uh, so there's certainly a justification for it, but with that comes uh, some overhead. And so we have to deal with that. Are there other alternatives? One, thing's, one thing I have noticed, uh, and I've worked uh, Air Force, NASA, Army in my career, uh, across that spectrum, uh, that the same FAR uh, can be uh, the, the practical application of that FAR and more specifically, the time frame that it requires to get a contract in place can vary wildly between government agencies. So why is that? And it really comes down to people and perspective. And uh, so uh, I, there was, uh, I'll have to quote a, a former NASA employee and a former Air Force uh, uh, general officer, uh, Pete Worden, uh, we, were, we asked him one time, because uh, Ames Research Center was doing some phenomenally fast things from an acquisition standpoint, how are you doing it? He said, well, I've told my uh, lawyers to be courageous. So uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know that there's a, a pat answer. There are techniques. There, uh, DARPA uses other transactional authority uh, very successfully. And uh, that is, not a, that is, that is w uh, widely available to the government, and yet it's not used very much. And I think we need to go back and look at why are we not using other transactional authority uh, approaches more than we, than we are. Uh, I will tell you, uh, with the experience we've had with Special Operations Command, uh, they are a unique uh, combatant command in that they have their own acquisition authority. And it's because of the nature of their mission. Uh, special operations, uh, special operators, you know, SEAL Team 6, I mean, that's part of the world they live in. They have to be incredibly responsive. They, when they need something, it has to be delivered. and They can't be slowed down by... Uh, I guess we use the word bureaucracy. So they have their own acquisition authority. Uh, we are procuring a, I, not one that I talked about today, but we're procuring a space system uh, through a BAA they have. They said, well, uh, our, our BAA process is uh, 30 days from uh, proposal receipt to award. Well, we couldn't match that. We couldn't come close to matching that within the Army. 30 days from proposal receipt to award, they can do that. Uh, so it's legal. It's within, it was in the bounds of the federal acquisition process. Uh, so I, I, I don't know that I have an answer. I can just tell you uh, people uh, are very successful at doing it quickly and legally, and people are very successful at doing it very slowly and legally. So uh, we need to figure out uh, how to do it better. Across the board. Great response, John. Thank you. One more question? Okay, if there's no more from these, I'll ask one. Okay. Uh, John London, primarily for you. You talk for, uh, mostly about CubeSat sized payloads and developments. Why don't you discuss for about two or three, two minutes or so the uh, choices you're making between CubeSats, small sats, ride alongs, and large developments? So uh, to, to a large degree, it often boils down to one word, and that's power. Uh, depending on the power requirements you need can, can dictate the size of the bus. Uh, so that, that's one short answer. Uh, I will tell you we're looking at all solutions that uh, we think are out there, including uh, hosted payloads. Uh, hosted payloads are attractive, at least on the surface they're attractive. Uh, you, you peel back the layers and you find out that there's no free lunch. Uh, there is no easy way to just pop a payload into space. Uh, there, there's a uh, price to be paid whichever way you go. Uh, but we start with power requirements when we're trying to define what the size of the bus is. Uh, also, if you have uh, something that just simply requires a large envelope because of the laws of physics, and an example would be an optical system. You know, you can't cheat physics 
Uh, and so if the optical system is a certain capability that you need, it's going to define an envelope that may be uh, outside uh, what uh, the optimum from a price point maybe uh, solution you'd want to have, so you need a bigger bus. So that, uh, in the case of Kestrel I, that was certainly uh, the situation there. It wasn't the uh, the down the um, the data rate uh, for downlinking or, or any other aspect. It was simply the size of the optical telescope that we were flying for that. So uh, th there's no straight answer, but we are wide open to looking at any solution that may be out there commercially or otherwise to get payloads into space. Uh, as, a, as a Department of Defense uh, entity, we do have to pay attention to things like cybersecurity and things like uh, data encryption, which may not be readily available on the commercial side, uh, and, and just, uh, you know, protecting the, uh, the, the chain of data that we have uh, in a potentially contested environment of the future. So you have to, there's a lot of factors that have to be weighed into the, the bus selection process and the direction you may go. John. I'd like to thank all of our panelists again. Okay, everybody ready for the last session in here before lunch? It's a good one. Um, I get the pleasure of introducing Dr. Mike Griffin for our spotlight. And I was thinking there is nothing that I can say in his bio that you guys probably don't know. Um, Mike is, uh, has been uh, very accomplished. He is the, uh, an independent consultant in the aerospace and defense field. Uh, he was uh, chairman and chief executive officer of Schaefer Corporation. Uh, in part of in one of his four trips to four trips right to NASA, he was uh, our administrator. Um, he's a he's a prolific speaker, a prolific writer. Um, he's a good band to know, and um, and I don't know what he's going to talk about because there's nothing that I could have said to offer him that would be more interesting than something that he would come up with and, and talk about with you. Um, but uh, the one thing that I will share with you that m many of you may not know is that he and I both spent our formative years in Rome, Georgia. So we're the two rocket scientists out of Rome, Georgia. But uh, anyway, Mike Griffin, come on up, Mike. Chris's introduction was uh, very nice. It was the second best one that I can immediately recall. My, my favorite of all time was the guy who said, uh, you can find out more about Mike on Google than he would ever want you to know. <laughs> I, will, I will always love that one. It was, it was so clever, I wish I'd thought of it. Um, I'm going to try, in, in keeping with the theme of this conference, to cover some a fairly broad uh, arena rather than talking about specific goals, specific destinations, or even specific agencies or arenas in the space business. Uh, I, I want to try to cover a little bit broader waterfront, and as is my usual fashion, I will speak extemporaneously with a couple notes I made to remind myself what I wanted to talk about. Um, John tells, um, Chris tells me I need to be off by 12.15, and I'd like to leave at least a few minutes for questions, so I'll endeavor to do that. So let's get to it. Um, I, I think at times we're in need of pulling back the stick in the airplane, climbing up to 10,000 feet, and looking out over a bit broader landscape rather than worrying about this CR or that program or, you know, this schedule or that congressman or senator or, or whatever. Um, we talk a lot, you know, about 
who will be the next administrator or the one after that at NASA or the next secretary of the Air Force or, or the next director of the NRO. Well, you know, folks, um, without, a, without an appropriate strategy, not only for those agencies but for our nation in space, I don't really care who is running the various agencies. It really just doesn't matter unless you've got goals worth pursuing and that are thoughtfully defined. So let me recap. When the 20th century began, uh, America was not a world power. When World War II began, America was at best a nascent world power. Um, the British Empire was still the world power. Uh, I'm fond of saying that when I was a kid in the 50s, the map of the world was still mostly colored in pink. That was the color of the British Empire. But in, in the 20th century, and particularly the latter part of it, the United States became the superpower, primarily for one set of strategic choices, and that was that we were going to preem be preeminent in aerospace. That led to, um, it, that, those decisions had consequences. It led to uh, a research and development base unequaled in the world. It led to an industrial base whose volume and precision no other nation could match. It led to a workforce far superior to that of any other nation or group of nations in the world. And it led to the execution of, I'm just broadly going to say missions or programs or projects, however you want to think about it, in air and space uh, that awed the rest of the world. Now, I'm reluctant to offer uh, too much credit to any individual person or individual decision, and so I'm going to say that these things were the result of a de facto industrial policy uh, that was in some cases planned and in some cases uh, fortuitous and in some cases you know, an emergent property of other decisions that were not necessarily foreseen. Um, but we had things. Um, among them, scholarships for engineers to go to college on, particularly after, after Sputnik. We had the GI Bill, though, 10 years before Sputnik, uh, that allowed World War II veterans to go back to school and get an education, later expanded to any service veteran. Um, we set grand goals for our nation. Um, we had role models, individual people, people of people who were successful and accomplished were looked up to uh, rather than denigrated for their success. Um, we were a wealthy nation, as we are today, but we had a societal commitment to spend some of that wealth to preserve and extend and expand upon our capabilities. Uh, entitlements were a few percent of our budget, not 65 percent of our budget. Um, when I say we were the world superpower, of course it sounds as if I'm omitting the then Soviet Union from the calculus, and I'm not. Uh, Russia was, was then uh, a formidable adversary. But note, they were a formal, formidable adversary for only one reason. In no other respect could Russia compete with the United States, but in one respect they could, they had space. They had long-range bombers, they developed ICBMs uh, as we were doing so or even a bit ahead. They had aerospace. And that ability alone put them front and center on the world stage with the United States. And there was a message there. Um, but the United States uh, was the deciding factor in World War II and later in the Cold War because of our preeminence ultimately in the broader uh, range of aerospace. In aviation, American airliners dominated world airline development and sales. We had several vendors, not just Boeing. In civil space, in 15 years, we went from never having flown anyone in space through Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and Skylab, our first space station, and into the development of the shuttle. 
Um, in the national security arena, we had a suite of uh, X-planes in the late 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, the SR-71, we had the Corona intelligence gathering uh, system followed by Gambit and Keyhole. We had the Defense uh, Meteorological Support Program, weather satellites for the Defense Department so that they would know not to waste pictures over cloudy terrain. Um, a host of other national security aviation and space programs. In our purely military capability arena, we developed Polaris, Poseidon, Trident, Atlas, Titan, Minuteman, Peacekeeper. Um, all of these things established for all the world to see uh, that the United States was across the board preeminent in all things aviation and space. Um, those were not accidental decisions. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in, in, in just a moment. Uh, when we look today, we are still, I don't want to say preeminent because I don't think we are. I think we are near the lead in many areas. We're leaders in others, uh, but we have challengers and we are not the clear leader in all things aviation and space the way we once were. Our ability to project power where we wish and need it to be projected is not what it once was. Our ability to prevent others from projecting power to our detriment is not what it once was. So what's missing? What, what do we need to do? I mean, and I'm up here, you know, for a half an hour offering my opinions, and so I'm, I'm not just going to cite what I think the problems are. I'm going to offer a few thoughts. Um, my recollection, and I'm old enough to have an actual recollection, uh, I can read about others' recollections, but I've got my own. In the 50s and 60s, um, it seems to me that we had a common understanding. I mean, this was taught in the history books to kids in school at the time, that the isolationism of the 1930s didn't work, uh, that uh, America first should not mean America alone, that the United States needed to engage in problem areas early and often rather than waiting until problems festered, uh, the, the Neville Chamberlain approach to the appeasement of the Nazi uh, empire uh, did not work and would never work. Um, we understood in a very deep sense that our advantages in science and engineering and in our industrial base were what, what, were what turned the tide in World War II. Um, Vannevar Bush, the nation's first presidential science advisor, published a seminal report at the end of World War II called Science the Endless Frontier, in which he laid out the strategy by which the United States would remain for decades preeminent in all things science and technology. Um, we understood that our technical preeminence was what, uh, during a war in which historians variously estimate the casualties, but but I can round them and say 55 million people-ish, as my daughter would say, uh, died during World War II. The United States lost 500,000 people. 55 million people dead, 500,000 of them came from our country. Um, we understood that technological superiority in any area, in all areas, were what allowed us to win wars with a horrible but uh, still lower cost than anyone else. Um, we understood that there were frontiers uh, of geography, of science, of technology, of mathematics. There were front frontiers in computer science and that we, this nation, needed to be on them or we would fall behind. Out of those, what I view as paradigms of that era, uh, came policies and goals. I mean, we had a de facto industrial policy. We understood that aircraft carriers, 
advanced fighters, bombers, tankers, uh, submarines, missiles. In that era, even satellites were not commercial market items. We understood that they would not exist without uh, the support of government po enlightened government policy and, and without the support of the taxpayers who supported those policies. In, in a representative democracy, without the support of the taxpayers in the long run, uh, policy doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, we understood that Russia had an industrial policy. And for all their inefficiency, when they beat us to orbit with Sputnik, it was a shocking moment for the United States. We now know that the missile gap that Kennedy and Nixon argued over and, and all that didn't exist, or if it existed, existed in our favor. Uh, but with our lack of insight into what the Soviet Union was doing in the late 1950s and early 60s, uh, we had to assume the worst. We understood that we needed to respond to these challenges and, and that we needed, in fact, to make sure that the challengers always understood they could not prevail. We understood that aerospace is not largely a market-driven sector. Uh, we understood that in the, in the economic sense of the term, that aerospace was an arena subject to market failure. That's a, a technical term, meaning supply the conventional laws of supply and demand do not work, broadly speaking, in aerospace. Um, we understood that development timelines were too long, too expensive, and we understood that most of, of, of even the commercially applicable items in, in dual use uh, would not exist without government uh, involvement in the sector. I mean, to illustrate the Boeing 707, the first successful jet transport aircraft, arose out of the KC-135 tanker development, and so on. I'm fond of saying that although today a license to own and operate a commercial communications satellite is equivalent to a license to have a money printing machine in your basement, um, that that sector could not exist without the industrial base created in space launch and, and space satellite um, components driven largely by the national security industry that if the commercial communications satellite sector had to develop from scratch uh, and support from scratch all of its own componentry, it would not exist. Um, so what do we do to fix all this? Well, I would submit that we again need the kind of social paradigm that at least in the arena of science and technology, and particularly in aerospace, um, that we once had and that we have so far taken for granted that we've forgotten that we had it and we've forgotten that it's important. We have come to believe, I, I think, actually, without even really thinking about it, that we regard our national preeminence in the world, you know, we have 5% of the people and control 25% of its wealth. Um, we think that comes with your American passport. We don't remember that it was earned by the sacrifices and, and by and large, good decisions of our forebears. Uh, we, we think it is conferred upon us as a result of where we were born, rather than having to be earned by every generation. Um, we now, we, we almost denigrate grand goals. We say we're going to Mars, um, but we don't actually make any budgetary decision that enhances the probability of or decrements the probability that we will go to Mars by a certain date. Um, we criticize missile defense until something like a North Korea pops up onto the world stage in a really serious manner, and, and now I note with some, uh, some certain amount of glee that many of the people who didn't want missile defense now wish we had more of it. Um, I, want to, uh, I, I want to suggest a, a paradigm that we might, as the space and the aerospace community, usefully push. 
usefully pursue as being along the right lines. And uh, I didn't think of it on my own. I got it off of Gerst's charts yesterday, where he illustrated his, his seven principles of a sustainable exploration program. Now, when, when Bill and I were working in, together at NASA, we were the, uh, uh, the closest of collaborators and the best of friends, and I, and I you know, miss working with him every day, really. Um, but we are, both of us, for good or ill, uh, I will say the, the driest of, of engineers, the, the, the Joe Friday, just the facts ma'am of engineers. So Gerst's principles are a bit dry, uh, despite being, I think, quite, quite accurate. But his last one uh, that he illustrated yesterday, for all those of you who were at the luncheon talk, was about um, a commitment to a sustained human presence in space, that we will never again not have people in space. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought that that actually should be the title of his chart or his overriding principle or his first among equals principle from which the other six uh, are now derived in support. Because this nation does not have an overriding commitment yet to always having people in space. We retreated once from the moon during Apollo. Why did we do that? I mean, if you would think about it, when historians look back, they're going to say the United States spent $21 billion in 10-year dollars developing a capability to fly people to the moon and allow them to live there for a short period of time. We spent $3 billion using it, and then we threw it away. Um, that will be a historically suspect decision in the fullness of time. Uh, the United States spent quite a lot of money developing the Skylab station, our first space station. We built a couple of them and threw them away. We spent many billions of dollars and 14 lives learning how to build the f world's first partially reusable spacecraft, uh, used it for several decades, and then threw it away with no successor. That, too, will be a historically suspect decision. We have retreated many times from our own space frontier. Um, we used to have an SR-71 that could fly three times the speed of sound at altitudes publicly stated greater than 80,000 feet. Uh, we don't have that anymore. Does anyone think it might be useful if we had such a thing? I won't go on and on with my list of things that, as I said yesterday, one can find in museums that you wish you still had. But the overarching commitment of the United States in, in all things aerospace should be that we will never again retreat. We will never again fail to have human presence in space. We will never again have a slower airplane than we used to have. We will never have, again, an airplane that can't fly as high as what we used to have. We will never again fill in the blank. We will never again retreat from the frontiers of aviation and space. That is, in my view, the single dominating factor which allowed our nation to become what it has become. And if we back away from it, it will be the single factor. There will be many, but it will be the single factor which most influences our ability to do so in the future. I'm going to close and then take some questions by saying that the Chinese understand this. Russia understands it. The Chinese today are building and have tested dozens of times, as is well known. Aviation Week had a report on it just a few weeks ago. They've tested dozens of times hypersonic systems that can overfly our air defense and underfly our missile defense. If the Secretary of Defense today had to order a carrier into the South China Sea and China didn't want it there, that carrier would be at risk. If this is a position that the United States cares to accept going forward, then I would submit we are on our way to being the American version of losing the British Empire. We have decisions to make about whether we wish to accept that and about whether we wish to believe that um, Entitlements and interest on the public debt is more important than preserving for our grandchildren the world that our grandparents gave us. 
those are my remarks for today. Thank you very much. I'm happy in the eight minutes I've managed to leave. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Sorry to be so sobering that there are no questions. <laughs> oh, okay. Don't worry, sir. We've got some for you. Since you since you mentioned the public debt, there are those who argue that not just paying the interest on that debt, but the very existence and preponderance of that debt is in itself an existential risk to the United States. What are your thoughts on that risk, and how would you advise the government to balance that risk with the risk inherent in losing our technological dominance in the aerospace realm? Um, well, first of all, I don't know that, I mean, I spend a lot of time offering free advice to the government that mostly they don't take. <laughs> so, um, and I try to confine it within areas where I, might be thought to have some amount of expertise. Uh, politics and fiscal policy is not one of those. I will, however, say that I find myself in agreement, very strong agreement, with your thesis, and, um, and, and, and frankly, more directly with the comment that Mike Mullen, Admiral, Admiral Mullen, made a few years ago when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and in one of his not his outgoing speech, but in one of his last speeches, he made the comment that he thought that the public debt uh, was America's biggest national security problem. I think he was talking about it in the longer term. It's not the kind of thing that you'll wake up the day after tomorrow and it will have destroyed us, but in the long run, I, I agree with that comment. Um, and I think not just the interest on it, but the principal needs to be paid down and, and we need to start living within our means. My personal opinion, that's some combination of appropriate taxation and reduced entitlements, specifically aimed at reducing the debt. But again, I have no expertise in fiscal policy and would not presume to do so. I just, I just do believe, though, that uh, when we owe as much money as we do to other nations in the world, that's not a good thing. Um, so I'll stop, I'll stop there. Another question up here. Um, thank you for your remarks. Um, just to, we had we had a panel on the science and technology and the overlap between um, science uh, between defense and civil space, um, and then we also talked about the, dipl the diplomacy benefits uh, to international space exploration. Curious your thoughts on the balance between the two benefits and how they're integrated within similar agencies. Well, the. Uh, I have many times made the point that for the money we spend on it, if it served no other purpose, our uh, s civilian space program is worth every penny for the diplomatic benefits alone. I frankly never thought about that until I became administrator of NASA and began, you know, frankly for the first time to spend a lot of time with high-ranking members of foreign governments. And everywhere I would go, they wanted to talk to me. And I have no personality and no charm. The reason that they wanted to talk to me was that I was running NASA, and the brand name of NASA matters everywhere in the world. And I, I was just stunned. Um, I'll add to that by saying that, although I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it in this venue, our national security space program is, offers one of our most far-reaching diplomatic tools. We can see and hear things others can't see and hear, and we can elect to share or not share, and those capabilities bring allies and partners to our table in preference to those of others. When and if we lose that advantage, why are people going to, or, or those twin advantages of civil space and national security space, why are other people going to want to partner or ally with us? Because we're so nice? I don't think so. 
Um, the United States needs to be able to stand alone when necessary. That's something great nations need to be able to do, but great nations need allies and partners. And we need, it, it is in our interests proactively to create assets and advantages which cause other nations, even when they have differences in other areas, to want to partner with us. And so I, I am the strongest possible fan of, of international programs, international collaboration, international developments in the science and technology arena. Now, to flip, to go to the other side of the coin, what about our technological advantage? Well, I, I think our technological advantage is gained and, and maintained by working harder and running faster, um, not by walling off our technology under the assumption that everybody else in the world is dumber than we are because they're not. So I personally regard ITAR and export control as damaging to our own industrial base and have said so every time I've had the opportunity. Now, the Obama administration loosened ITAR, some, some of the ITAR and export control regime. Uh, I would like personally to see it much looser. I would like to see our industrial base competing on the world stage on an equals basis rather than being walled off in any sort of protectionist approach. Pretty soon it becomes the Special Olympics. You know, we're, we're winning a pro or a, or a handicap golf tournament. We're winning a prize at our handicap level, but the other people are playing at scratch. And, and that's not what you want. So I'm not in favor of sharing <laughs> militarily sensitive operations and plans and, and critical technologies, but we go much, much, much further than that in trying to protect our industrial base. In the long run, it is a mistake. We gain a few years of security, and we sacrifice long-term security, my opinion. Last question here. Uh, <clears throat> I agree with your uh, thesis about the stagnation in aerospace over the last <coughs> generation. Uh, so my question is basically uh, to help the aerospace industry uh, get new brain power and new ideas from a wider set of people, how would you go about doing that to help NASA and some of the other government agencies capitalize on new ideas not inside well, their agency. The people go, your, your, your comment is, is on point because in the end it's all about the workforce. Um, if, if you don't have the right people, you, nothing, will, nothing will be accomplished. Um, but you get the right people by setting grand goals, uh, having strategic, having a strategy um, to which people can sign up. Uh, when you offer kids the opportunity to work on a spacecraft, a robotic spacecraft that's going to land on Mars or a habitat that people are going to live in in space or on the moon or later on Mars or whatever, or on advanced aircraft, um, kids will, will do hard things. They will spend time learning rather than partying on the margin in order to be able to be part of that. I mean, you all here are evidence of that. It's not the easiest thing in the world to get a degree in computer science or math or engineering or any branch of science or uh, you know, any of the kinds of technical disciplines that support what we do. It's not an easy thing. Um, but the, the, the record is very clear. Uh, when, when you put fascinating challenges at the national level in front of people, uh, they will they will sacrifice to join that workforce. But if 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 you give them oatmeal, they will go and order something else at a different restaurant. Mike, thank you very much. We appreciate what you've said to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. All right. Well, so that concludes our sessions in here today. Uh, we'll head over to the lunch. Two important things. Remember to take all of your stuff with you. Uh, and number two, uh, the bus stop, for those of you who are using it, uh, will be moved to outside the student services building. So when you leave the lunch, you can just walk right out, hop on the bus, and get over to the parking lot. So thank you all for coming, and we'll see you at the lunch. Thanks.